Great to see all of you again. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness to us despite our unfaithfulness and that you continue to love us and have a relationship with us even though we sin um, prior to becoming Christians, but even after becoming Christians, Lord. And thank you that you draw us to yourself and that you would have fellowship with us uh, and that you allow us to worship you like this. And as we talk about the vision for our church in particular, as we talk about holiness, the importance of it, and the, the importance of it and the application for the church, help us to apply it here and help shape the church to be what you desire, what you know is best, and help us to apply it to our personal lives. And I pray that as we look at your word and share uh, this vision this morning, that we would see why holiness is so important, Lord, and uh, we would understand what it is and what it isn't. And we thank you for this time. Help us to remove distractions, to just be focused on you. And I pray that even now you'd be shaping Woodland Christian Church to be uh, what pleases you most, Lord. This church is for you. It's not for us. We benefit from it. We are edified. And we thank, we're thankful for the fellowship that we recognize the church is to worship Christ. And so we desire to see a church, uh, our church, do that and be that, Lord. Um, but really only through through the ministry of your Holy Spirit and the application of your word can that be the case, and so help help us to apply it and walk in it. We thank you for this time and pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So last time I preached, I shared that we were talking about the vision of our church. Haven't done that in a little over seven years, so do to talk about that again. And in this morning's sermon, you can tell from the title and probably from my prayer that we're going to be talking about holiness. The title of the sermon is The Need for a Holy Church, if I didn't say that already, The Need for a Holy Church. And it's part of our vision to have a holy church, and I want you to understand why that's the case. And so the vision ser sermons, I would say, they're not um, about our theology or our doctrine. I mean, you can read our statement of faith to see what we believe. When we talk about the vision of our church, it's more about, uh, you know, who we are, why we do things the way we do, what's important to us, kind of the direction we want to go, directions we don't want to go. This morning is kind of setting up a sermon next week about a direction we don't want to go, which is being seeker-sensitive. We'll talk about that a little bit toward the end of the sermon, but this kind of lays a foundation for that and why holiness is important and why we don't want to be a seeker-sensitive church. We'll talk about some other things like that over the next few weeks, but just to be clear, this isn't really a time to talk about why we believe what we believe, but more about why we do what we do and uh, the, you know where we want to go and where we don't want to go as a church. And I'm going to back up a little bit get a little momentum into this discussion of holiness by asking you to consider something. I know I have shared this before, I believe the last time was a few years ago, but it bears worth repeating because we could have new people, but also because I think it's one of the um, best ways to understand why holiness is important. And it relates to this, that God's pattern throughout all of human history, or you could even say even before human history, as we'll see in the uh, first example I give you, is to have an inside and an outside, an inside and an outside. And this brings us to lesson one. God always has an inside and outside. God has always separated the people that belong to him uh, by having them inside from the people who do not belong to him, uh, allowing them to remain outside. And I said it even precedes human history because it occurred to me that the first person to learn that God has an inside and an outside was not a human being. Who's the first individual to learn that there's an inside and outside? Yeah, Satan. Satan learns that, learned that there was inside heaven, and then he learned that there's also outside heaven when he is cast out along with the demons who joined him in his rebellion. And then the first people to learn that there was an inside and outside would be who? I'll give you a hint, it was the first people. Yeah, Adam and Eve, right? <laughs> uh, there was inside what? Inside in the garden, inside Eden, and then outside Eden. They learned about outside Eden after they sinned. A few chapters later, it started raining for the first time, and people learned that there's inside what? Yeah, inside the ark and then outside the ark. And uh, other people have the potential to be inside the ark, but they had rejected God. They had rejected his prophet and this preacher of righteousness, and they found themselves outside the ark. You move through the Old Testament, and I want to go through this kind of quickly because I have mentioned it before, but there is an inside and outside for every single historical book. Or another way to say it is, is, is every book uh, in the Old Testament that discusses the history of, of uh, Israel, but also the world in general, deals with a physical inside and outside that has physical boundaries. So we were in, talking about Genesis, and if we move to Exodus, God unleashes these plagues on the nation of Egypt, and everyone learned that there was inside Goshen, right? 
where the Hebrews were safe, and then there was outside Goshen, where all of the Egyptians were unsafe when they were afflicted by all those plagues. You leave the book of Exodus, God delivers, or actually kind of toward the end of Exodus, you see God delivers Israel from Egypt, and then there's, there's in Egypt, there's outside Egypt. You go into Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they're traveling through the wilderness, and it's like this really uh, lengthy camping trip. And you see that there is inside the camp, and there was outside the camp. People were put outside the camp for different reasons, while the rest, the rest of the Israelites remained inside the camp. And then the other historical books, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, you see that there is inside the promised land, there's outside the promised land. You look at the post-exilic books, or those books dealing with the history of Israel, after their exile in Babylon, in Ezra and Nehemiah, they're returning to the land, and it's still dealing with inside the land and outside the land. Now, that can, brings us to the end of the Old Testament. You move into the New Testament, and this pattern does continue, because when God became a, a man in the person of Jesus Christ, what did he bring with him from heaven to earth? He brought the kingdom with him. He brought the kingdom of God with him. That's what was preached, right? We've talked about this a little bit, that prior to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ— that when they preached the gospel, they couldn't preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because Christ hadn't died, been buried, and resurrected yet. So what were they preaching in the gospels? They were preaching the kingdom of God. You see that repeatedly. And before Christ, if you go before that, before the gospels, before God, before the kingdom of heaven came from heaven to earth, you're in the Old Testament, and then they're preaching the coming of the Christ. The Christ brings the kingdom, and now they're preaching that kingdom. And at that time, there was inside and there's outside. Listen to this language. Matthew 21, 31, Jesus said to the religious leaders, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Mark 4, 11, Jesus said, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables or is a mystery to them. Luke 16, 16, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is preached and people are forcing their way into it. You reach Acts, you leave the Gospels, now we're post-death, burial, resurrection of Christ, the dispensation or age in which we live, and now there's inside and outside the what? After Pentecost, there's inside and outside the church. Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom. Believers are told that we are to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. 1 Thessalonians 4, 12, walk properly before outsiders, Paul discusses the qualifications for elders, 1 Timothy 3, 7, and he says that we must be well thought of by outsiders. Probably the clearest discussion of inside and outside is in one of the clearest discussions of church discipline in the New Testament, which is 1 Corinthians 5, this man engaged in, in uh, this immorality, and, he, and Paul says, I'm not there physically, but I'm there in spirit. This man's inside the church. He needs to be put outside the church. And that's really what church discipline is, is taking an individual in unrepentant sin who's inside the church who needs to be put outside. Almost what was taking place with the nation of Israel in the camp was prefiguring or foreshadowing when individuals were removed from the camp, put outside of it. That's what Paul looks back on when he writes this. In 1 Corinthians 5, he says, what do I have to do with judging outsiders? Which is to say what? We're not worried about judging those people out there and what they're not doing. They're unbelievers, and so we expect them to act like unbelievers. But then he says, is it not those who are inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. So Paul says, you don't need to worry about them. God will handle them, but we do have a responsibility toward each other inside the church. This pattern, it even continues for eternity. Revelation twenty-two fourteen. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers, sexually immoral murderers, idolaters, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So you've got believers who are inside, unbelievers who are outside, and it seems for eternity. Now, I want to ask you to think about something. In all those examples that I gave you from the Old Testament, the boundary was physical. There were physical boundaries to Eden. There were physical boundaries to the ark. There were physical boundaries to Goshen. There were physical boundaries to the camp in the wilderness, and obviously the promised land had a physical boundary. Those physical boundaries established or determined what was inside and what was outside. 
But when you reach the New Testament, and we're talking about what? The church, there's not physical boundaries any longer because the church is spiritual. Now, you could say when you go through those doors, you're entering the church, but in a sense, it's only us being in here that allows it to be the church, right? You remove all the believers from the building, there's really no church because the church is the believers. If you're wondering what, what would identify a church, it would be generally believers who are then governed or under the authority of elders. Just a, a group of people being together would not be considered a church, but when you have offices, biblical order to it, that's a church, and there's not physical boundaries. There are spiritual boundaries for the church. Now, how do we create, if there are no physical boundaries between the inside of the church and the outside of the church, how are we going to establish this boundary or what would create it? It would be holiness. And this brings us to lesson two. Holiness separates the inside from the outside. Lesson two, holiness separates the inside from the outside. So if we're talking about holiness for a church or you're talking about the boundaries of a church, the church would be those individuals who are under the authority of, of elders who are governing a church, and then it's going to be the holiness of that church that is going to provide the boundary or separation from the world. Holiness is what allows people to recognize that they have left what? That they have stepped out of what? Stepped out of the world and into the church, that they have moved from being among those who are not God's people to being among those who are God's people. So when we're in the church, we have the wonderful uh, blessing of being among God's people, but then when we leave the church and we're moving around the world, we're among those who are not God's people. But without holiness, you can't tell the difference between the church and the world. You can't tell if you're still among those who are God's people or you're among those who are not God's people. There's no separation. Essentially, the outside would look just like the inside. Now, if you take your minds to the Old Testament, there were moral commands. What, what are some of the moral commands, some of the most common ones? Huh? Yeah, don't murder, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't lie. These are what we think of as like the common sense commands. They are the most well-known commands in the Old Testament. But there were also amoral commands. There were amoral commands or commands that did not deal with morality. That's why, so whenever you read the Bible, you don't want to say that there were laws there was God's law, the Mosaic law. It's always spoken of singularly, but it contains 613 commands. So you would not say God has laws. You could say that God had hundreds of commands, but all within one law, the Mosaic law. In a moment, we'll talk about the law for the church, which would be the law of Christ. But under the Mosaic law, it came down and essentially had these two categories of commands. Of those 613 commands, many of them are, are moral, or they're dealing with morality, lying, stealing, adultery, murder, theft, covetousness. But then there was also this category of commands within the Mosaic law that did not deal with morality. And what are some of, some, these are like the, what we think of as kind of weird commands, right? The things you don't really understand why God commanded them or forbid them. These would be commands that are associated with clothing. Now, when I talk about clothing, I'm not talking about uh, modesty because modesty is moral. Modesty is not amoral. It is, it is moral for us to dress modestly. But I'm talking about tassels they had to wear. I'm talking about fabrics that they weren't supposed to uh, mix together. I'm talking about the commands associated with farming certain ways. I'm talking about commands associated with their beards. Leviticus 19.27, you shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. Now, some of you are so unholy, you don't even have beards. That was just a joke. I, nobody really laughed. That was just a joke. I didn't mean that too seriously. Although the bearded men in here just went, amen, pastor. <laughs> amen. Preach that. Preach that. Okay. So here's what you could ask. You could say, what is the big deal about mixing fabrics? And I, and I guess that's actually the point. The point is what we do with hair or beards as men is amoral. It's not a moral issue. What's the big deal about mixing fabrics together? Or why do they have to wear these tassels on their clothes? Or why, why would God care how they gardened or, or what they did with their beards? How does that make Israel good or better? Or how, does, how do these commands make Israel moral? And the answer is, they didn't. These were not commands associated with morality. What, what did make Israel moral? The moral commands. 
those commands dealing with sin and righteousness and unrighteousness. And here's what's really interesting if you think about it. The moral commands that God gave to the nation of Israel are those commands that made Israel look what? Like the other nations. Does that make sense? There has never been a civilization throughout all of human history that did not recognize certain things were wrong or sinful because every civilization throughout all of human history has had people in it who had what? Even if they did not have God's law. Romans 2 explains this very clearly for us. Had consciences which condemned their actions or told them, accused them, or excused them, as Romans 2 says, told them it's okay to do this, it's not okay to do this. This is, this is right or moral, this is wrong or, or bad or sinful. And so all civilizations have this code of morality. And so the moral commands that God gave to the nation of Israel actually caused the nation of Israel to look what? Like the other nations of the world. If God is going to set Israel apart or have them be a holy nation, then there must be commands of an amoral nature that don't deal with morality that allow Israel to look second. And that's what these ceremonial commands did. They allowed Israel to be holy or set apart from the surrounding nations. Now, what's the application for us? God called Israel to be holy in the Old Testament, but what has he called the church or believers to be in the New Testament? He has also called us to be holy. We have the same call on our lives as a church or as believers to be holy as Israel had in the Old Testament. First Peter 1.15, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Now, here's the question, which I, I can almost anticipate you wondering this, and I think it's a very good question. You're saying, well, if Israel was holy by observing all of these ceremonial commands, or, or if Israel was holy by, let's just say, observing those commands that to us seem a little weird or bizarre, does this mean that we need to observe those commands? Should we have tassels on our clothes? Should we uh, avoid certain foods? Should we get rid of our clothing that mixes fabrics? Or, or should we avoid farming certain ways? No, we don't, need, we don't need to do that. The ceremonial commands are not part of the law of Christ. They're part of the Mosaic law, which we're not under any longer. The, why, why were the moral commands in the Mosaic law brought forward, and why are they part of the law of Christ that we are under, because morality is unchanging because morality is tied to the nature of God himself. Let me say that one more time. Morality is unchanging because morality is tied to the nature and character of God, which is unchanging because God is unchanging. So something, there's never been something that was moral and then immoral. There's never been something that was immoral and then became moral because all morality is tied to God who himself is unchanging. So we never, we don't determine morality or immorality by looking to ourselves. We don't look at other man. That's why the world looks the way it does because the world is filled with people who are looking at other people to determine what is moral or immoral. Instead, we must look to the nature or character of God as revealed in the word of God to determine what is moral and immoral. But it still brings us back to the same question, then how are we going to be holy if, it's not, if, it's, if our holiness is not tied to these ceremonial commands? And the answer is by being separate from the world. We avoid worldliness, and this brings us to lesson three. Holiness in the church means avoiding worldliness. Holiness in the church means avoiding worldliness. I'm trying not to be repetitive and not talk about some things too much that I've already talked about before that I believe are established in our church. But if I then go through something too quickly and it leaves some confusion, if you have any questions about anything I'm talking about, please seek me out either after service or send me an email so I can be clear. Because we're reaching one of these points I don't want to spend a whole lot of time about. You, you would think in a sermon about holiness, we'd spend a lot of time talking about what holiness is, but I think we've I hope I've been clear uh, a few times in the past that it, we, make, we tend to make a mistake with holiness. We associate holiness with morality, and I would discourage you from doing that. We tend to think that if something is holy, then it's moral, or it's righteous, or it's good, and if something is unholy, then it's bad, or sinful, or wrong, or unrighteous. And you don't want to do that because you're going to be confused when you see Moses step on holy ground, because then you're going to say, well, what does that mean? Is that just ground that has never sinned before? You know, is that, is that ground that's more righteous than, than other ground? No. It's better when you hear the word holy to think of what? Separateness 
or set-apartness, and that just happened to be ground that was set apart because that's the ground that that had the the, uh, burning bush in which God was uh, dwelling and speaking to Moses from, the nation of Israel, or the land of Israel is the holy land. Why is it better or more righteous than other land throughout the world? No, it's not, but it is that land that has been set apart for the people of God, and so it's called holy for that reason. Two vessels, they could be identical. You know, the vessel that is in the temple is the vessel that is holy, not because it's better or more righteous than another vessel, but simply because that is the vessel that is being set apart for God's use. The other vessel would just be considered a a common vessel. Now, if we're thinking about holiness meaning, meaning set apart or separateness, for the church to be holy, it still means separate or set apart, but from the world. Israel is holy by being separate, and this is where you see the similarity or the carry from the Old Testament. Israel was going to be holy from the surrounding nations, and that call is still on the church to be holy, but from the world that surrounds us. A lot of verses I could give you, here's just three of them. Romans 2.12, when it says, do not be conformed to this world, that's practically synonymous with being told to be what? Holy. When it says, do not be conformed to this world, it means do not be holy, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is, or determine what is good, uh, will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. First John 2, 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. James 4, 4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity or hatred with God? Therefore, who wishes, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, I don't have to try to make those verses sound stronger. Those are some unbelievably strong verses. Just, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Friendship with the world is enmity or hatred with God. That is very strong language that should sober all of us to the importance of holiness or avoiding worldliness. Hebrews 12, 14, this might be the strongest verse I could give you. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Unholy people will not see the Lord. That, that is an uh, almost shockingly strong statement if you really consider what's being said there. Without holiness, no one will see God. Now, that is not to say that we are saved by being holy. I don't take it to mean that, but I do take it to mean that saved people are going to be holy. That is a, a byproduct of our regeneration or being brought to life spiritually that people who are saved are holy. And so uh, people should be able to look and consider, do I look just like the world? Am I not at all separate from the world? If, could I spend years with unbelieving friends and they would never know that I'm a Christian because I look and talk and act and sound so much like them or so much like everyone else in the world? Should that be the case, they should cons- that person should consider whether they're really a Christian or not because it seems very evident to me that one of the products of a saved life is holiness. So if we have a vision to be holy as a church, then we're not, we're not going to you know, focus on tassels and food and on fabrics or, or gardening or farming certain ways, but we are going to focus on being separate from the world or not allowing the world to creep into the church. And the only way that the church can be separate from the world is if there's a division between the two. And it's holiness that creates that division or separation. And if you think about the examples that we discussed, God always made boundaries between his people and the world, and those boundaries were never blurred. The people in the Israelite camp never looked around and said, hey, why don't we make sure that the inside of the camp looks just like the outside of the camp? The people in the promised land never said, hey, let's make sure being inside the promised land is just like being outside the promised land. Jesus never came and said, well, you know, I don't want to be exclusive. I don't don't want people to think that I'm being harsh or selective. I don't want people to think that I'm being impartial. And so let's just make everyone feel like they're part of the kingdom of God. Why don't I just come and allow everyone to believe that they are part of this kingdom that I have brought? I would not want anyone to think they're excluded. So let's make sure everyone feels like they're part of it. Hopefully you notice the application for Woodland Christian Church. There must be a clear division. And so what that means is when people come into our church, they should recognize that there are uh, things considerably different in here than when they are outside. They should come into our church, and what are some of the things that should be different? 
What are some of the things that should be different that should not look, or I'll give you a hint, sound like the world? Our music should be different. Our language and our speech should be different. People should not hear the language or the jokes or the crudeness that they would in the world. Our actions should be different. Our behavior toward each other or toward unbelievers should be different. Our clothing should be different. And again, that's not really so much a discussion, although I do think actually now maybe it is something that needs to be addressed more. Maybe I will even have to put it in another sermon. It wasn't that long ago when I didn't think that the uh, you had to define too clearly the way people dress. Now, when we talk about um, clothing, I don't, I'm not including modesty in this because modesty is very moral. Modesty is absolutely a moral issue. I'm just talking about articles of clothing where there, you know, there's a liberty for people to dress certain ways, but now it's to the point with all of the transgenderism, with all, with all of the hatred of God's defined roles, the denial of God making, um, you know, them male and female, that we, maybe we do have to have this conversation. We do at least need to be talking to our children and our sons about this is how boys dress, this is how boys act, this is how boys talk, this is how girls act, this is how girls dress, they look different, there are distinctions between the two of them. This past week, someone called me and he said, would you be willing to talk to my son because my grandson, his son, is in the public school system and he is entertaining be, being a, a young girl? And I said, I, I can talk to your son. You know, as he plugged into to a local church, I've never met the son before. I don't, I don't know the grandson. And I said, but I'll just tell you, it, there's very little that I'm going to be able to do if, if this child remains in a, in a school system that is convincing him because that's where he said this pressure was coming from. Here's, here's what was the, what was the uh, bizarrest about this, or saddest, bizarre is probably too much of an understatement. The saddest part of this entire uh, story was that the pressure for this boy to become a girl was coming from the school system that he was attending. And so I said, what, what, I can talk to your son, and I, I would even you know, talk to, the, to your grandson if, I, if, if they were ever in the area or something. But what are the chances that I'm going to be able to spend you know, an hour, even two hours per week talking to them, but then they're going to be in, in a system that's going to be pushing him to become a girl for, you know, five days per week, six, six to eight hours per day. There's little, there's little uh, you know, influence I'm going to be able to have overall. And so I really think there's got to be considerable instruction or teaching from parents to their children about the way the boys do things, about the way that girls do things. I didn't plan on talking about this, but I do think it is, it is very important. I mean, even with, you know, my boys, so sometimes they're, they're wrestling, and so one of the girls happens to jump in, you know, and I, you kind of pull the boys aside, and you say, no, you may not wrestle with your sisters like you're, like you're wrestling with each other. You know, one of my boys could look at me and say, well, I, I actually think one of my sisters could probably beat one of us, you know, one of my older sisters. And I said, well, it's not, it's not really the issue of whether Ray is stronger and she might be able to, to wrestle with you, Noah. The issue is that you're a boy, you know, and that's the conversation with Noah, and he says, well, I, I think Rhea would do really well, basically in his own way, he's saying, I think Rhea might be able to beat me, because she, I said, she, yeah, she probably would beat you, but that's not really the question here. The question is, what is appropriate for boys? What is appropriate for girls? What is masculine? What is feminine? What, what should you do and what, with your brothers, and you should not do this with your sisters, and you might be upset. There's few things in our home, at least, that's going to get my sons punished as strongly as, as hurting one of their sisters. You know, 1 Peter 3, 7 says that God has made women the weaker vessel. That doesn't mean emotionally or mentally, but it does mean physically. And so you talk to your sons and you say, well, why did God give you greater strength? For what reason? So that you can protect. The God, this is what God expects you to do in the future with your wife, your daughters, and at this time, this is what he expects you to do with your sisters. And so, should you ever hurt, at least in our home, should you ever, one of my sons ever hurt one of his sisters, that's a very serious offense. It's, there are a few things that will be punished as, as strongly or as, as uh, harshly as that is. And so, it is actually really important to have these conversations about what is appropriate clothing, what would be masculine, what would be feminine, what looks like it's blurring the lines here. Because if we're talking about separation here, there aren't, many, there aren't many boundaries that are being destroyed by the world faster than the one between, you know, manhood and womanhood. So, so to bring that back to the church, we would want that reflected. People should be able to come in here. Men wouldn't look like women. women. Women wouldn't look like men. There would be a clear distinction between the world and what takes place here in the church.
And this is why it's important to understand the difference between morality and holiness. Or this is why it's important not to associate holiness with morality, because if you understand the distinction between the two, the question is not just, is this good or bad, right or wrong? The question is also, does this look like the world? If you understand that holy or holiness means separation, then the question isn't just about morality or what's right and what's wrong. The question then also for the church is, does this look like the world? Does this sound like the world? Is this what the world does? If so, when it comes in here, then that, that it compromises the holiness of the church, the boundary that God wants to exist. Now, sadly, when churches try to reach the world, and I understand this temptation, they want to blur the line that exists between the church and the world. And kind of the thinking is this, we will reach the world by looking like the world. We'll be more attractive to the world if we, if we resemble what they're doing. But hopefully we can tell that's not God's plan. He wants this very clear distinction. Now, for me, I did not grow up uh, in a Christian home, as I've shared many times. And I will tell you that what was so refreshing to me was going to a Christian church for the first time and seeing the distinction or separation from the world. It, it was the contrast between what I had known my whole life and then what I was encountering at the church that helped make the church so attractive to me. For many people, they turn to Christ because they're sick of what? Because they have seen what doesn't work. Yeah, the world, what the world is promoting, what the world is pushing on them. They don't, they don't know what the answer is yet. They haven't heard the gospel. They don't know Christ, but they at least know the answer isn't out there. And so they're looking someplace else. They want, they want to find this answer. And so they're tired of the world, but if they come into the church, and then the church looks like the world then they can't even leave the world because they come into the church and then they encounter the same world that they're trying to get away from. And then they can even become convinced that there really is no difference. There, there are no answers for me out there. I'm sick of the world, but I can't really escape it. And so to have that strong contrast between the two is what makes, allows the church to be attractive. It, will, it was what was so refreshing to me. It was seeing things and experiencing things that I had never witnessed or experienced before, and I'm, I thank God that that early church I was part of did not look like the world, or who knows, you know, maybe I wouldn't have even wanted to return the next week because it wouldn't have seemed any different than what I've had my whole life. Now, to ensure that this separation exists between the inside and the outside, there's something we, we need to avoid, and that's being seeker-sensitive, and this brings us to lesson four. Seeker-sensitive churches blur the line between the inside and outside. Seeker sensitive churches blur the line between the inside and outside. Now, this is, I'm introducing something that we will elaborate on more next week, but it's worth saying very briefly that there are probably some seeker, church, seeker sensitive churches that are, for lack of a better way to say it, um, maybe aren't, aren't as bad or don't do this as, as much as we're talking about here. But in my experience, from the people I've talked to or the experiences I've had when I've been in a seeker sensitive church, I do, I do think this is a very fair um, description of them and of their motive to remove this line because they believe that this is what will allow them to be more, more attractive to, let's say, seekers or to the lost or to the, to the unchurched. And that's what it means to be seeker-sensitive. They would say, uh, as the name implies, that it's all about reaching unbelievers for Christ. And I want to be clear, that, that's not the problem. We would say that's commendable. We hope that every church has the desire to seek the lost. I, don't, I hope I've never sounded as though I think our, our church is the best or the only church or has no weaknesses. I believe at times I've shared about some of our weaknesses from behind the pulpit. One of, one of our weaknesses, are, although I think it's improved considerably since Pastor Nathan and Jill have come, is outreach and evangelism. They're helping us to grow in that area. But I've said I want us to be more evangelistic, or I want to I wanna see us have, have a greater heart for the lost. And so to be clear, that is not the issue whatsoever with seeker-sensitive churches. The issue is the approach that they take, the way that they go about that, trying to bring the world into the church to be more attractive to the world. And in that process, they remove, or yeah, blur, but perhaps even remove that separation or holiness God desires. Go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 9. This is one passage we need to resolve, resolve because it looks like it defends being seeker-sensitive. 
this is the passage that looks like it presents the strongest defense of being seeker sensitive. And so let's understand what Paul is saying here and what he's not saying or what he's, what he's recommending and what he's not recommending here. Verse 19, Paul says, though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. And when, in this context, when he says win, that's synonymous with what? Save, right? To see saved or be born again. And he uses the same word in verse 22. And how did Paul win these people or see these people saved? He gives the answer. He said he made himself a servant to all. There were lots of slaves in the Roman Empire. My understanding is one-third of the entire population in the, in the empire was slaves. Now, Paul wasn't a slave to anyone except whom? Christ, right? He was, and I don't, I don't just mean spiritually speaking. I mean, literally, he wasn't a slave to anyone except Christ because he had Roman citizenship. He was free, but he said that he was willing to become a servant or do loss or really a slave to people to see them saved. He didn't go and get a master. It's not that literal, though. He didn't go and get a master and become a slave. He just meant that he made people his master, or he became what people needed to, uh, he, really, he became what he needed to be for people to be more receptive to him, to hear the gospel from him. And he explains what this looks like in, these, in the following verses. Verse 20, he says, to the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. Let's go ahead and pause right here. Paul wasn't bound to any Jewish ceremonies. He wasn't bound to any Jewish traditions, but he's saying that he would participate in them if it would make Jews more receptive, receptive to him. He would be as Jewish as possible if it would allow the Jews to better hear the gospel from him. And you see it in the book of Acts. He's going into the synagogues. He's doing many Jewish things to reach Jews. He's reasoning with them from the scriptures. The next part of the verse, he says, to those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. Now, I'm convinced these verses are only going to make sense if we see two separate laws. So just give me your attention so I can explain this. If you've never heard this before, this will hopefully help you understand much, much of the Bible even. So you've got two covenants. You've got the old covenant and the new covenant. The mediator of the old covenant is or was Moses. And there is a law associated with the old covenant. And the law is associated with the mediator, which is why the law of the Old Covenant is also called the Mosaic Law, because Moses was that mediator. We're under the New Covenant. There's a, there's a, a better mediator of the New Covenant, and that's Jesus himself, right? And there's also a law associated with Christ, we know as the law of Christ. Hebrews, I can't remember the address, but it says that whenever you have a change of mediator, you must also have a change of law because the law is attached to the mediator. And so as soon as you, you leave Moses, you leave the Mosaic law and you come to the mediator of the new covenant, which is Christ and the law that is associated with him. And what Paul's doing here is he's saying, I will put myself to reach those who are under the Mosaic law. I will become as one under the law. And then look what he says in the parenthetical statement, because he didn't want people to think that he was still under the Mosaic law. He says, though not being myself under the law, that I might be able to win, and he means not under the Mosaic law, that I might be able to win those that are under it. It is especially interesting to see Paul talk about putting himself back under the Mosaic law when it seems like he spent so much of his ministry following conversion doing what? Yes, preaching against it, trying to deliver people from legalism and show them that they are not bound to the law for salvation. Here's just two simple examples. Acts 15, they're having that council, and it says some believers who belong to the Pharisees rose up and they said it's necessary to order these people to keep the law of Moses. Well, right before that, Paul and Barnabas showed up and it says that they had no small dissension and debate with them about keeping the law of Moses. I, I kind of take this to be in language like that, a very serious argument with them when these people said that they had to keep the law of Moses. And then the second example would really be the book of Galatians. If Romans is, is, let's say, the book of the gospel that's explaining the gospel very well, Galatians is our book of independence from the law. The book is largely showing that we are no longer bound to or under the Mosaic law. Now, we are under the morality of the Mosaic law, right? We talked about that earlier because that's brought forward and is part of the law of Christ because morality is unchanging. So we still see those moral commands, but the ceremonial commands are dropped. Now, in Galatians, here's what's interesting. 
To me, Paul seems to be about as gracious as someone could be. If there was something good that could be said to a church, Paul was going to find it. I mean, he could take churches that had a lot of problems in them, like the Corinthians, and he could still find things to applaud. Do you know the only church in which Paul did not have one single commendation for them? The Galatians. And why is that? It seems to me because they couldn't get the gospel right. And if you can't get the gospel right, and there's nothing more foundational than that, then it seems that Paul doesn't have anything good good to say to you. Paul was so afraid of the Corinthians thinking he's back under the law that he added that parenthetical statement there. Now, here's my point. Despite this great aversion or very strong preaching and teaching from Paul against being under the law, he still said that he would put himself under the law that he didn't need to be under if it would allow him to see more people be saved. Look at verse 21. To those outside the law. Now, who were those under the law? That'd be the the Jews, and when he says to those outside the law, now he's talking about the, the Gentiles. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. And then now notice this. As soon as Paul says he's outside the law, now what is he afraid of his Corinthian readers thinking? That people are going to think he has license to sin, that he has no, he's just a very lawless man. So he puts another parenthetical statement, and he says, but not, he says, not being outside the law of God, but being under, and here it is, the law of Christ. So even though Paul wasn't under the old covenant, he was still part of the new covenant, which meant being under the law of that new covenant's mediator, which meant being under the law of Christ, so that he might win those who were outside the law. And this brings us to lesson five. Draw the line at immorality when being all things to all people. Draw the line at immorality when being all things to all people. Paul is talking about the lengths he would go, and you can tell by his language in verse 21 that he did not want anyone to think that he would be what? Sinful or immoral. And so I would submit to you, Paul was only willing to do those things that were amoral that would allow him to be received by people. Listen to these two verses, Galatians 5, 6. In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. Galatians 6.15, neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. It's very clear that Paul thought or preached that circumcision meant absolutely nothing, spiritually speaking. You're not better or worse under the new covenant if you are or aren't circumcised. Which is why it's interesting he did what with Timothy? Had him circumcised. And why is that? because he knew, he knew he was going to be preaching to Jews who were not going to be receptive to him if he was uncircumcised. Acts 16.3, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. He took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places so that they would better hear from Timothy, even though Paul knew better than anyone else and had spent an amount of his ministry convincing people it didn't matter if they were circumcised. Another example, Acts 18.18, 18, Paul cut his hair for he was under a vow. So he cut his hair to win more people. And why was he willing to do these things? Because they are amoral. I'm convinced Paul never would have done any of these things if they were immoral or sinful. Let me show you one more example. Look to the left at chapter 8, 1 Corinthians 8. You might remember when I preached on this chapter a few months ago, the context is food, and food is what? Yeah, food is amoral. It is non-spiritual. You're not better or worse if you do or don't eat certain foods. That's the context. Verse 7, not all possess this knowledge or not all know that food is amoral, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol and their conscience being weak. Notice that is defiled. Verse 9, take care this right of yours doesn't somehow become a stumbling block or don't eat food in such a way that it would stumble others or stumble, he says, the weak. Verse 10, if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak? And then verse 11, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. Verse 12, thus sinning against your brothers, winning their conscience when it is weak. All right, so hopefully you caught the theme, which is the word weak, which Paul repeats at least five times in these verses. And he's describing people who thought they didn't have certain liberties that they actually had. And he just said that they have a weak conscience. 
And even that, just to let you know, that is amoral. People are not better or worse, moral or immoral, if they have stronger or weaker consciences. The stronger person is the person who, who uh, observes their conscience and also is gracious toward others who don't share the same convictions that they do. So my reason for having you look at those verses is related to chapter 9, verse 22. So turn back to chapter 9. With this understanding of what weak means, your conscience forbids something, and look what he says in verse 22. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. So with this understanding of what weak means from chapter 8, we know that what Paul's saying in chapter 9 is this. When I deal with people who don't recognize some of the liberties that they have because they have a weak conscience, I will restrict myself too. I will sacrifice my liberties and I will, I will embrace their weak conscience or apply it to myself so that they would be more receptive to me. Uh, and these verses, they're just all about the lengths that Paul would go to see people saved, which I think is really kind of a crucial um, discussion here when we're considering seeker sensitiveness or holiness for the church. These are like the premier verses that might seem to argue against that. But it's, it's pretty clear to me that what Paul was willing to do was anything that was amoral that would allow people to say, what are the examples we've talked about? Circumcision, food, hair, cutting hair for men, and these are all amoral issues. And Paul said, I will do those things if it will see more people be saved. But there was no way, it seems, that Paul was going to do anything immoral or sinful to see people be saved. There's some, some time ago, I don't know if you guys saw this, there's a gentleman named Perry Noble who's recent, who even not, not even that long after he had done this, ended up being uh, fired from his position. He was at a mega church and he played Highway to Hell in this church service. And he had the worship team uh, leading everyone in, in, this, in this song. And uh, his defense of it was that someone came up to him after that service and said that the person got saved, I guess, singing that song or realizing that they were on a highway to hell, or I guess was the reason that Perry Noble thought this was such a good idea to sing the song. And, and it, it seems to me that this argument is so absurd because the argument is basically that the ends justify the means, right? As long as we can say that there is one good thing that's produced from this, we can justify almost anything, including even singing a satanic song in the middle of service, if someone can come up after and say that they're saved. And it kind of begs the question, well, what, what if someone hadn't come up and said that to Perry? Would he have acknowledged that that was a very evil thing that he, that he did with his church? But the point is, the ends don't justify the means. We don't look and say, well, we think if we do this compromising or immoral or sinful thing, then we're hopeful that there will be this good thing that's produced as a result. So that's why we feel very comfortable doing that. We don't do that. We look at God's word and we say, well, what is the morality? What is the holiness that he wants us to embrace as a church and then apply that and so that's that would be what i would say that we're talking about the vision for our church and our vision is that we have a holy church so there's a clear distinction between the world and the church which i'm convinced is actually one of the strongest evangelistic tools we have as a church for us to communicate to those when they come in that when you're in here it is going to look and feel and be different than when you're out there because we've been saved by christ he has changed our lives, and you will not have the same experiences here that you had out there. Now, I want to conclude with this. These verses are about the lengths that Paul went to see people saved, but as I reflected on them, I couldn't help think that they really only prefigured the greater lengths that Christ himself went to see us saved. Paul condescended, as we read, to meet people where they're at, but you think about the infinitely greater way that Christ condescended to meet us where we are at. You know, Paul would come down to whatever level was necessary to reach people with salvation, but how much further did Christ come down to reach us with salvation? Look again at verse 22, but I want you to read this verse as though Jesus himself is saying it, because I'm convinced Jesus is really the only one who could say this verse in the truest and greatest sense. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Now, when Paul talks about becoming weak to the weak, Paul's already weak. <laughs> I mean, how much weaker could he really become? We're all frail, 
fallen, sinful people that are always moving one day closer to our deaths. So I would submit to you, Paul didn't really become that weak, but who became weak? I mean, who was willing to give up their strength, their glory, their greatness to meet sinful, weak people? 2 Corinthians 8, 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich for your sake, he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. That's what it looks like to become weak. Paul said, I've become all things to all people. Did Paul really become all things to all people? I mean, he was already a person. What's the big deal about dealing with other people? What did Jesus do? God took on human flesh. I mean, when Paul says that he became all things to all people, I appreciate the lengths he went to and what he did, but absolutely pales in comparison to what Jesus was willing to do. I mean, when you talk about becoming all things, he was willing to become a man. He was willing to be tired, sick, rejected, betrayed, crucified, experienced death itself for us. Philippians 2, 6, Jesus was in the form of God. He didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant, being born in the likeness of men. And then Paul says this, that by all means I might save some, did Paul ever save anyone? No, Paul never saved anyone. Now, I appreciate Paul, one of my heroes, may, probably no greater man in all of, all of church history, you know, and I don't include Christ in that, in that discussion. Obviously, he's, he is in a category all his own, but in all of church history, I mean, who, who could be greater than Paul? But when Paul says, I might save some, Paul never saved anyone. Paul doesn't save anyone any more than I've ever saved anyone. So when I read this, I think Jesus is the one who saved people, God used Paul, but Christ was the one who saved us. And Paul, and especially Jesus, they did much to win some, but they did so while remaining holy, and so should we. Shouldn't our appreciation for what Christ has done encourage us to strive to be holy as a church that is set apart for him and a good witness to the world? Father, we thank you for the church and being able, by your sovereign grace, to be part of it that you have, you have saved us, allowed us to be your sons and daughters and be part of your family with you as our father and Jesus as our brother. And we desire to be pleasing to you. We believe that's the best way for us to reach the world. We don't want to lose one of the greatest evangelistic tools we have, which is our holiness. And so I pray, Lord, I don't pray for my agenda in this. I don't ask that my will or desires would would be played out in this church i pray you would direct us especially as elders um, but as a church as well to be holy what that looks like in a way that's pleasing to you and satisfies your desires for this church because we do recognize that it is your church it's bought and purchased with the blood of your son and so we we want to please you we can benefit from church or we do benefit from church we are thankful for the edification the privilege of worshiping you but we're here for you lord this is, this is not primarily about us or for us. This is about you and for you in response to what you have done. And so let us have a church that pleases you and that you can look down and, and enjoy what happens here and find pleasure in it, Lord. And I pray that uh, for us and ask for your gracious hand to direct us as we move into the future. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.